examples we were talking a little bit about is music. So um, I'm Canadian, and the one of the great Canadian pastimes is to hate Nickelback. But of course, Nickelback is a pretty successful band. Um, so if you don't know Thomas Kincaid, you might know Nickelback. And maybe you can sympathize with me, or you're going, what are you talking about? Nickelback is great. But if you are, please don't tell me. <laughs> and, and, and you can also say, you know, there's, there's another argument to be had considering music. Um, a, a good friend of mine is a big fan of Steely Dan, um, a band from the 70s. I can't stand them. I, can't, I have to leave the room when they're on. I just hate them. But listening to them, I understand that it is well done music. There's a lot of talent there. There's a lot of skill there. I understand why people who are not me would like it and would value it. It's very, you know, so it's good art. It's just good art that I really don't like, right? So you can have these three different categories operating all parallel to one another, right? The economic value of something, the artistic value of something, and then the subjective value that that thing has to you as a person when you're deciding how much economic value on it whether you want it in your house or whether you want it on your stereo. Yeah, so that's, a, that's kind of a lot to, um, to think about. So I'm going to take this opportunity to let everyone know that you can ask questions anytime, and we'll tackle them a few times through the, uh, through the event. And uh, these, are, these are the kind of basic things that we're going to be building on through the event. So if you are not clear, feel free to ask questions. Um, so that's one way that we can get confused about art. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, well, art and subjective, eh, subjective value. And in subjective value and art, it's a little bit more obvious. People kind of get that to each their own. But on other topics outside of art, there are some things that people believe it, the value isn't subjective. For instance, there are a lot of people that believe things like gold have inherent value, or people who believe that the amount of work that someone puts into something should matter and how much it's worth. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that because I think that's an important distinction as well from a theory that says that value is uh, primarily subjective. Right. I, th I think actually, Jenna, that the labor theory of value is really interesting um, pr when, you, when you think about art. Um, there's a, an art movement called Dada that was big in, in the 60s, and Marcel Duchamp was, was famous for um, artistic stunts like taking a urinal from a men's room and, and mounting it in the, in the Louvre as part of a, as an artistic exhibit, and I think it's called Fountain or something like that. And people look at that and become outraged. All he did was take a urinal from a men's room and decide that it was art, and then all of a sudden it's an artistic piece, and it is worth, I don't even know what that, that would go for, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. Probably a lot. Nothing except move from one room to another room and declare that it is art. And so they're mystified how with this little work, something can gain that much in value. Yeah. Right. Another Which example would be those paintings that are kind of a big block of color with a line through it. Yeah, color field paintings. Yeah, yes. absolutely. When you have sort of a, a like arrangement in blue and gray, and it's a big blue square with a a, a gray stripe across it, and people say, "Well, my you know my five year old could do that, right? Why is that? If there's no effort in it, how is it art?" Yeah, and by contrast, Thomas Kincaid probably spends quite a bit of time <laughs> because there's a there's a lot of detail in those yes. paintings. <laughs> Enormously so, yeah, effort. There's, there's definitely that's a that's a, a common theory of value, and it's not quite right um, because, for instance, things can be valued for quite a bit more. And in the case of Thomas Kincaid, or in the case of a lot of things, you can put a lot of labor into something, um, and it's a little bit more obvious in things that aren't art. Uh, for instance, you could spend I could spend a really long time doing some electrical work for you. <laughs> it would not be very valuable. It might work. <laughs> But the amount of work that I put into it is not what's important. What's important is whether or not it works for you, which is um, a lot more subjective. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, uh, I, I know uh, how I feel about things like gold having some sort of intrinsic value. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't think it's necessarily a settled question. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, we're getting out of my territory, so I'm getting a little nervous here. Oh, that's I'm not, okay quite sure what you mean by intrinsic value in that case. I mean, it seems to me that that 
uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, it's valuable is because it's it's rare. One of the reasons it's valuable is because of the uses to which we put it. But um, if uh, aliens landed tomorrow with spaceships full of gold, um, we wouldn't suddenly be an incredibly rich. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if, the, if suddenly everybody had buckets and buckets and buckets full of gold, gold wouldn't be worth that much anymore. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot. Of, and I, I think that although you were out of your comfort zone, I think that was a good way of putting it because, yeah, you're right. It, what matters is how useful it is to us and how easy it is for us to put it to the uses that we want to put it, um, right. which is not something that's intrinsic to gold. It really depends on us and how we value it. Um, right, and and you know you can look at literary examples too. There's a great novel by Frank Norris called McTeague, which is about among other things uh, the gold rush in California, um, and it ends. I'm going to spoil it for you guys now. I'm sorry, but the novel was written in like 1901, so I, I feel like the spoiler warnings have kind of run out by now on this one. Um, but it's a great novel, and you should read it because it's very strange and it's a wild ride. But it ends with. Um, two mortal enemies um, stuck together in, in Death Valley, um, dying from thirst with all kinds of gold around them, right? Wow. And that gold is not doing them a whole lot of good right then. What they need is a good bottle of water, right? And right. they don't have it, and, and, so, and there's no one to get it from, so the gold's not worth anything. Yeah. Which is interesting, because there is more water than gold. <laughs> which is a whole other webinar. <laughs> That's Adam Smith. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Uh, so, Sarah, if you have anything else that you want to talk about on subjective value specifically, please, please feel free, because we don't have any questions just yet. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I'll encourage you to ask them now. And while we do, I'm going to launch our first poll, which is oh, just a, a little poll, bit... A poll. It is. It's just a little bit of fun for you guys. I'll give you about a minute to answer. Um, and it just kind of allows you to weigh in, even if you haven't thought of a specific question. Um, and yeah, and as I said, this is the stuff that we're going to kind of build on. It's okay that you guys don't have questions now because it leaves us time for more questions later, which is fun. Um, and maybe these things will trigger different thoughts as we go into art more specifically. So my favorite uh, labor theory of value um, example, Janet, because I spend a lot of time talking to college professors, um, is, is about student papers, right? Because there's always the kid who got the D on a paper and comes in and says, but I worked so hard, right? Um, right. And, and you have enormous sympathy for the kid, but you have to say, yes, you worked really, really hard and you produced a D paper. Um, yeah. It's not about, you know, it's not about sometimes how hard you worked. Um, there, are, there are other standards that, that are in play. Um, For sure. Okay, I'm going to give you guys just a couple more seconds. And I will close this and we will reappear. And uh, hopefully you guys can now see a amusing comic um, from Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. Um, and this will help us launch into our next uh, discussion, which is going to be on art more specifically. Hooray. So, yeah, and we talked a little bit about this already. Everyone agrees that tastes vary, but sometimes people talk about art being priceless. Um, and we talked a little bit about people saying, well, you know, some art, uh, I don't like it, but it's worth quite a bit of money, um, or I don't understand why it's worth money, but it's worth a lot of money. But what's going on when people start saying that art is priceless? It's a really good question. Um, I think sometimes it means, I don't want to think about putting a price on it, right? Putting a price on it seems to um, sully it with all of that evil economic stuff that we don't like to talk about and that we don't like to think about, right? Um, artists, however, are perfectly happy most of the time to put a price on their art because yes. they're trying to make money from it, they're trying to make a living from it. Um, mm. This, it's a tricky one. Um, when Milton wrote Paradise Lost, um, the publisher paid him 10 pounds for it. Um, and people tend to get outraged um, by that because 
to pay 10 pounds for this epic poem uh, that is one of the greatest works of English literature and that we are still reading uh, 450 years later um, seems, it seems like it was a little low. It seems like he didn't get paid enough money, right, for that. Paradise Lost is priceless, right? But one of the things that makes it priceless is the stuff that Milton's publisher couldn't have known, right? One of the things that makes Paradise Lost priceless is that we're still reading it 450 years later. Milton's publisher did not know and could not have known that that was going to happen, right? He didn't know that it was going to become a major cultural touchstone for the 18th century and the 19th century and the 20th and the 21st century, right? right. So that's, that's completely unpredictable. What he had on his hands was a really, really long poem about the Bible by a guy who had been in an extraordinary amount of trouble for being part of a rebellion against the government. Right, so 10 pounds under that circumstances, with those considerations, a pretty good price for it. Um, yeah. And that's back when 10 pounds was 10 pounds, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as opposed to whatever it is now. Um, right. And that's the kind of, um, I mean, I don't know if anybody ever tries to say that the Mona Lisa is priceless. Um, uh, the comic uh, that should be below or possibly beside or maybe above us, depending on how you have us configured, um, kind of shows how economists, as you said, people don't like to put these nasty economic values on things, and yet they exist. So I, I'm going to have to move something out of the way. It's something like 800 times more than the value of a human, 872 times more valuable than a human life, um, which is, of course, something else that people are, I think, justifiably uncomfortable with putting a price on. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's a, it's a product of the times, but it's also a product of, uh, and we had one comment uh, from Rachel, who says that she thinks that value is sometimes assigned by experience of which it was a part. For instance, the flag that was planted on the moon is probably more valuable than a flag that you could buy at Canadian Tire. Um, it doesn't need to be art for that to be true. Right. And, and this can go some way to, if we go back to Duchamp, uh, uh, making the particular urinal that he chose into art, one of the things that makes that art is that Marcel Duchamp said that it was, right? right. And that's, that is part of that something, that is that experience accumulating around a thing, right? Um, and so I think, I think Rachel's right about that. Um, I also think that, um, that things become so interwoven into the way that we look at the world and the way that we think about the world, that it's very hard to imagine what life would be like if they didn't exist, right? So think about, I don't know, um, Shakespeare's plays, or think about the Beatles, right? right? Um, love them or hate them, right? The Beatles music is everywhere. Everybody's heard it. It's, it's woven into everything. My six-year-old sings Yellow Submarine, not because I play it for her, but because she's heard it somewhere. Right. It's just sort of in the, in the cultural air. And so when we talk about what's the Beatles music worth, one of the things that we're, one of the sort of counterfactuals we're trying to imagine is what would the world be like if, what would the world that we have now be like if all of a sudden this thread that has been running through it for so long suddenly doesn't exist. Yeah. That's a so it's hard to think of a world without the music of the Beatles in it. It's hard to think of a world without the Mona Lisa in it and without the eight million parodies of the, the Mona Lisa. In it. <laughs> yeah. yeah right? That's a big part of how it's contributed. And obviously something that's not really val I, well, I don't know. Actually, I don't, I don't know if there's any way to know if that's something that's valued in the value of the Mona Lisa when they say it's 872 times the value of a human life. <laughs> For people who don't read Saturday morning breakfast cereal, I actually believe that he looked it up. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure that I, there's somebody involved with that comic is an economist, clearly. <laughs> yeah. oh. uh, it's great if you guys don't uh, regularly check it out do um, and I know that I wanted to put aside a little bit of time because Sarah has her most valuable piece of art or That's one true. of 
one of, I don't want to cause fights, one of her most valuable pieces of art. Actually, I have two of my most valuable pieces oh, okay. of art. If we, that she's willing to share with us. So I'm going to um, give her a second uh, to I, they're right here. taste I'm the camera and get them. So these, these are, um, this is priceless art for me. The, the first is titled um, Little Dogs by Penelope Washoe, age six. These are the little dogs. <laughs> And uh, the second, uh, by Abigail Washoe, a related artist, is a Robot on the Polka Dot Planet. Um, these are the most valuable pieces of art that I own. And I expect some of the people uh, listening to this uh, webcast probably have similar pieces of art that they value similarly. Um, they were free. Well, I should. They, they have a zero dollar price tag on them. Let's not use the word free because I'll be bombarded later by economists arguing with me. But they, had, they, they cost me zero dollars to acquire that piece of art. Um, but they are priceless and irreplaceable pieces of art. Um, but that value is entirely subjective. And I doubt very much that there's anyone else on the planet who would call them priceless. <laughs> Or demand, I, or demand the extraordinarily high price that I'm sure you would need to be paid to part with them. Yes. Um, anyway, yeah, guys, I'm a big softie, so I just had to let that happen. Um, Sarah recommend or uh, suggested it, and I thought it was a cool idea. So, given all of that, um, one of the things that happens an awful lot is that the government gets involved in art, um, and you hear yeah. arguments that the government has to be involved in art because um, artists can go unappreciated in their time, for instance. Uh, an example is not coming to mind because uh, it would be too convenient if it did. But I mean, there are a lot of examples of this and things are becoming more niche. So what's, what's the problem with that? What's, why is it so controversial when the government gets involved in art? Well, there, I mean, there are a lot of reasons, right? I mean, uh, probably for folks uh, listening Tonight, the objection is the government getting involved in anything, right? So <laughs> leaving that objection <laughs> momentarily to the side, um, there are some very unpleasant things um, that happen when the government gets involved in art. Um, there are unpleasant things that happen to art, and there are unpleasant things that happen to artists when you have government involvement. Um, so let's separate those out. Um, in the essay that I wrote in Why Liberty um, that Atlas published and put out with, in combination with Students for Liberty, um, I began the essay with a long list of artists who had been exiled, persecuted, um, uh, um, executed, um, put into prison, um, find enormous amounts of money and so on because the government didn't like the art that they were producing. Um, quite often, um, as a government tyrannizes, um, the artists are some of the first people who get into trouble um, because they have voices that are persuasive and they have voices that are individualistic and they have voices to which people attend. Um, and they are able to create persuasive works that can run counter to the things that the government would like them to produce. So you can think about um, Ai Weiwei um, in China and his dissident art. You can think about the, um, the punk band um, Pussy Riot um, in Russia who have been, um, where are they now? I believe they're still in prison in, in Siberia. Um, yeah, they may have been released. I, I don't think so, but I think they're still in prison. They were hunger striking. Um, you can think um, within the U.S. Um, a rap artist whose name is escaping me at the moment, Sarah, something, who wrote a rap about the sexist language that is common in other rap songs and was then fined by the FCC for using inappropriate language in her own rap. Yeah. Um, so she was not able to, to, to make the comment that she wanted and she was refused radio play and so on and so on. So um, these are some of the bad things that, that happen to artists the more government 
um, I don't want to say intervention, but the more government attention is given to art, yeah, um, the more that that art and artists are under government scrutiny, um, I think the more chance there is for the heavy hand of the government to um, to find artists and and to use to use their power to simply squash things that they don't they don't want to have said. What can happen to art? Um, is also a bad thing. If you're thinking about art sort of as, as a thing itself, um, the, um, the Nazis um, and the, the Soviets are sort of famous for um, government-produced art, right, and for government-funded, um, government-controlled artists. And there are exhibits of this kind of art periodically, and you see rapidly what happens to the kind of quality to the depth of the artistic work that is produced, to the um, to the breadth of subject matter that that can be covered, um, there's very often sort of one or two approved styles in which to paint, or in which to write, mm -hmm. or in which to compose, um, and you get an a, you get a limited and and constrained and confined kind of art that's produced for that, um, and so. It is a good thing, you know, Virginia Woolf says that in order to write, um, you need to have money in a room of one's own, right? It is a good thing to have a source of support for artwork, right? Whether that is a wealthy spouse, a wealthy family, whether it's having a day job um, in an insurance office like Kafka did, or as a doctor like William Carlos Williams did. Um, or a friend with a room. Or a friend with a spare room. Yeah. Or you know, or a way of sort of, or doing what Thoreau did, right, and lessening your needs, cutting back on your needs and cutting back on your desires until you can provide with the minimal work for your basic needs so that you can devote all of your time to writing. Um, that's good, that's good stuff. That does help art happen, but I think we have to be very cautious about saying the government needs to do that, um, because once you open that door and you let the government in, they're in there and they're observing and they're controlling. Um, they're, a, they're a very powerful patron and they're a patron um, that has not historically been at all shy about executing the artists who were not fulfilling their job description to their satisfaction. Yeah. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate just a little bit um, and okay. say that, um, of course, we saw terrible things happen under the Nazis and under communist governments, but governments today aren't that if they're not as they're certainly not as bad as uh, Nazi Germany or uh, communism under Stalin, for instance. Um, and they do provide support um, for the creation of art. Do you think that there's any way around? Uh, I mean, there. I, I know that there are some instances of of censorship. Like the government will not support extremely controversial art, even if some people find it quite valuable. Do you think that those little instances of censorship are are still important? Um, I do. I mean, we can look at, at uh, U.S. government censorship in, in World War II. I mean, right, we're the, we're the, forgive me, you're Canadian. The U.S. is the good guys, right, in World War we were II. We on your side. We've all seen the movies. You guys are good guys, too, right? Um, <laughs> And, and the, were the good guys, and there was heavy, heavy censorship of artistic production mm -hmm. during the war. Um, there was, um, there's been uh, heavy censorship in uh, in the movie industry since the late twenties or early thirties with the Hayes Code. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to say what we would have if there were not that kind of interference. I mean, my, my childhood was filled with, um, oh, I'm going to lose the name of the organization. There was a, a mother's organization um, that was all about censoring the rock music that the children were listening to. <laughs> it was very Helen Lovejoy type stuff. Um, and Frank Zappa was a big crusader against that because he was one of their main targets, right? And this is when you started seeing, you know, when I was a, a young teenager is when you started seeing warning labels on albums um, produced in the U.S. about language and about content and, and about that kind of thing. And, you know, yes, it's milder. Yes, uh, 
funding the arts, you know, if you want to talk about things I think the government should stop pouring money into, right, I got a whole long list and, and the arts are kind of right. down towards the bottom of it. I mean, if they're going to be spending money, I'd rather have them be spending money on art than, than on bombs. Yeah, for instance. Right. I mean, for instance, for example. Um, but um, but I don't I don't think it does I don't think it does artistic production a lot of good, and I do think that it gets in the way of um, it, as with as with other kinds of private funding government funding crowds out the private funding, yeah, um, and that's that's always a problem. Yeah, uh, that's I mean, and you we just also because of the nature of the government being something that's funded by everybody. Um, it's going to be very difficult for small artists who appeal to only a few people, even if they are extraordinarily important to those few people, to get funding from the kind of like the kind of uh, base that the government needs to appeal to. Um, so right. and it's, it's sort of hard to say that the types of people that we believe need the support, whose value is hard to see, are also the types of people. Um, where the value is very subjective and individualized, that are going to get the art fund, arts funding from something like the government. Right, and if you think, as I do, that one of the useful things that art can do is to provide a voice for people who we don't hear, right? Yeah. For people who's um, who, don't, who who we don't hear, for voices that we don't know are out there. Right. Another another big moment uh, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and south of Cleveland is Cincinnati, Ohio, um, which is a very conservative town. And there was an exhibit of Robert Mapplethorpe's um, photographs. Right. And Mapplethorpe is a gay photographer whose many of whose photographs are um, of nude or semi-nude gay men, often with a BDSM theme to it. Okay. Right? And his work was being exhibited in the Cincinnati Art Museum, which I believe is government funded. And okay. it the exhibit was, I also believe, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't check my facts on this because I didn't know that, um, I didn't know this was going to come up. Um, but I, I believe that that exhibit was either shut down or or censored or parts of it were, were made, be, were made to, to be removed from the exhibit. Um, and for me, that's a problem um, because, again, um, Mapplethorpe's work, like it or not, want to hang it in your living room or not, um, is artistically extraordinary um, and very important and well worth hanging in an art museum. And and it's a voice that you know in in the the mid to late. 80s as the AIDS epidemic was um, beginning to heat up and really beginning to spiral out of control and, and, and get a lot of attention. This was, this was a voice that people needed to hear. This was an artist who people should pay attention to and it was being shut down because it's a, it's a fringe voice and that's, that's a problem. When that happens. Um, okay, so yeah, it, we can definitely see how political art is, uh, is can be more controversial anyways, especially as far as the government's concerned. Um, but we've talked a little bit in the past and you've written, I shared an article of yours this week um, on the Big Ideas Live Facebook page about the value of political art. Do you think that people who feel that their voices aren't being heard should try to increase the amount of art that has, you sometimes hear, uh, conservative or libertarian writers saying, well, all writers are bleeding heart liberals. Uh, what are we going to do? The only thing that we can do is start paying conservatives and libertarians to start writing conservative and libertarian art to balance this out. Um, I'm, just, I'm saying conservative and libertarian. They probably don't say and. They say the one that they want. Um, do you think there's a problem with that? Do you think that that's, that art is still valuable? Um, I kind of know the answer, but I don't know if uh, I know the whole answer. So, well, I I think two things. I think I think many things all at once, apparently, and can't can't put them into order. I oh, wow. think that um, I think that there is more art that is interested in questions of liberty 
than we think that there is. I think, um, and you know, this is what this is what my column um, in the Freeman is is trying to do. Right, every other week, I write a piece about um, a piece of literature that hasn't been getting a whole lot of attention generally that has liberty um, themes in it or free market themes in it. Um, and while I'm not jumping up and down and, and shouting, the, you know, the goal of that is for people to look at those accumulated columns and say, oh, hey, you know, there actually is a lot of this stuff out there. Maybe we should pay attention to some of this stuff and maybe we should talk about it. And maybe what we need to do is bring our leanings for liberty and our desire for liberty to the art to the great art that's out there and see what's there that speaks to us and speaks to mm -hmm. our concerns and speaks to our interests. So that's part one. Okay, so I don't think that the problem is, can I make scare quotes on camera? There's my scare quotes. Uh, I don't think the problem is as big as a lot of people think that it is. Um, okay. I, I do think, uh, and, and um, I do think though, that it's always worth encouraging artists who are doing work that you love and that is important to you and that speaks to the things that you care about, right? So if somebody is writing um, novels with liberty-loving themes and free market themes that really, really appeal to you, buy them. Buy copies for your friends, hand them around, write fan mail write reviews about the stuff, get the news out there. If there are bands that are making music um, that you love and they are, you know, and they are anarchist libertarians or they are, you know, they're, they're writing and singing on liberty themes, help them, help promote them, right? Help, help buy them, help make that happen for them. Um, we have the power as consumers, right, to put our money where our values are. And so when we find it, um, buy it, promote it, and trust me, more will be produced, right? We believe in the market, right? We believe that we can send signals to the market and the market will respond, right? Um, if, it becomes, if it becomes profitable um, and important to produce good, liberty-loving, free market-loving art, we're going to get more of it, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, do, so do you think, um, given that there are probably people listening and people who uh, maybe watch us on YouTube, uh, we do uh, save these for YouTube guys, be sure to check us out, um, who would support liberty loving art. Do you think that that means that people should go out and just make, you know, do their rallying cry for liberty? Like, does everybody have to go out and write an Atlas Shrugged, for instance? Um, I'm sorry, I missed and... the middle of that. Does everybody oh, have to? Oh, it's okay. Uh, does everybody have to go out and write an Atlas Shrugged? for instance, or, or write some sort of uh, call to action um, in art, uh, just because oh, there do are I people think who will support the, it. The duty, the duty of every good liberty-loving individual is to make liberty-loving pieces of art? Sure, yeah. No, because <laughs> comparative advantage, right? Right. Um, if you make art, um, and... Mm, if you make art, you're going to make the art that you need to make, right? You're going to make the art that that comes from your desire to create and your desire to speak about things that are important to you. The stuff so that keeps you the art that you need to make. If you are a person for whom these things are important, that art will often contain some of that within it, right? But right. I, I think it's I think that it's a mistake in general to sit down and say, today I'm going to write a great novel about why it is important that we have a free market and right. why we should have smaller government or no government at all. Um, rather than, I'm writing a novel because I want to tell this story right. about these people going through these experiences. I mean, I think, um, think about Hunger Games, right? Which I think, and I'm not going to spoil it because the third movie isn't out and a lot of people are watching the movies and not seeing the books. But for those who have read all of the way to the end of the trilogy, and for those of you who will see the third movie and you really need to see the third movie, um, <laughs> by the time that you get to the end of this trilogy, um, you're reading a, a series that's remarkably anarchist um, yeah. in its 
in its preferences and in its desires and in the ends that it chooses for the characters about whom we care. Um, I doubt that the author sat down and said, I'm going to write an anarchist primer for mid-grade to high school readers. Right. It's possible that she did, but I think that she wanted to tell a story about Katniss and about the Hunger Games and yeah. about these competitions and about this this world that she saw so clearly. Um, and I think she wanted to tell us about that. Um, and that I, the anarchy in the, in the text arose out of um, the natural conclusions that come from the kind of story that she's telling. Yeah. I, I know another example is uh, Cory Doctorow has a book called Little Brother that I know that you love. Um, and I love it too, and I recommend it highly. Um, it was awarded a, I'm not going to remember the name of the award, but it was awarded a Libertarian Book Prize. It's about the surveillance state. And when he accepted the award, Cory Doctorow said, oh, yeah, I'm not a Libertarian. That's not really why I wrote the book, but I see how you guys got that. And that's cool that you did. So, yeah, just, I mean, I think that it's, you're right. The, you will find um, important messages in good art that people made with care. Um, right. well, or, you, or you won't, right? It might not appeal to you, but that, that doesn't mean that it's not out there. Right. David Simon, for example, has famously, people want, you know, libertarians go nuts over the wire. I mean, yeah. just out of their heads over the wire. And he was interviewed um, in Reason by Nick Gillespie, and David Simon said, you people keep trying to make me into a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian. The wire is not a libertarian. So leave me that alone. <laughs> um, and yet... Right? One of the things about making art is that when it leaves your hands and you send it out into the world, um, things happen to it and people find things in it that you, you weren't expecting them to find. Right? Um, okay, um, I'm going to launch our next poll because it really feeds right off of what we're doing here. And I've got a couple of questions that I'll start, um, I'll start going through now and give people a minute or two to uh, answer the poll. So the first one is from Sandy. He says, you're very careful to de define the subject of this discussion as economic value. Do you think value outside economics can be objective in any meaningful sense, for example, in art or ethics? Do, uh, so the question is basically, do I think that, art, that there are objective standards for value in art? Or out, and outside of art too, um, just outside of econ in what people normally think of as the economic sphere. I think he can correct me if I'm misinterpreting. That's a really good question. Um, and it depends, I think, a lot on whether we're talking about um, over time or at a given moment. Um, Art, and I'm gonna I'm gonna limit this to art, but I, I expect that this applies across the board um, to a lot of, of different things that that might be valued in ways other than economic. Right? Um, art is enormously tied up with um, historical taste and standards. Right? So, for example, um, one of my favorite poets, John Donne, is writing in the 1590s to about um, the the early 1600s um, is when he's, he's doing um, the most of his writing. Um, Dunn is phenomenal. He's the guy who wrote No Man is an Island. Um, uh, he's, he wrote Death Be Not Proud. Um, he's, a, he's a phenomenal poet, just incredible. Um, for years, um, from about the 18th century until T.S. Eliot started writing about John Donne in, uh, in the 19, mid, mid 20th century, uh, nobody read Donne. He was out of fashion. He was considered to be too irregular. He was considered to be too clunky. He was considered to be unskilled, um, over ornamented, ornamented just, just all sorts of very, very bad things. When T.S. Eliot starts rereading him um, and starts to write about him, um, and starts to point out the value that T.S. Eliot finds in Dunn's work, Dunn comes roaring back into style again, right? So I, it depends, right? You could say for the standards of tastes of the 18th century, Dunn's work is objectively bad, right? right. 
but by the time you get to Eliot writing great essays about John Donne, you can say tastes are changing, and in that moment, Donne's work is objectively good. So at particular points on a timeline, I think you might be able to talk about objective standards for aesthetics um, as, a, as a movement through the whole of human history, that's harder and probably the only way to start talking about that is that you sort of have to shrug and say, well, we have to see if it lasts. Okay. Right? So you can talk about, say, Sophocles' plays, which have lasted a really long time now and have fallen in and out of style, but they keep coming back, right? So that might point to some objective excellence in them, right? But, you know, it's, it's a long time. We're here for a long time, or at least hopefully humans are here for a long time as a, as a human culture, right? So I, I'm afraid that's not much of an answer, but well, it, the best I yeah. can. And I mean, I think in terms of if we were going to, and this, that was more an uh, aesthetics um, rather than the kind of value we were talking about, unless I misinterpreted you. Um, yeah, that was more about sort of yeah. subjective, um, artistic, aesthetic value judgments. Yeah. I, I would kind of just say um, for beyond art, um, when you're talking about I mean, you start to get into this thing when you think about economics a lot, where you're like, what's a non-economic value? Um, I mean, I think that uh, almost all value is going to depend on the person and the time and the place and what they need in that moment and in that circumstance. Um, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, if anybody feels that we haven't done a good job, feel free to jump in. I've got Or three rephrase questions. the question to make it easier. Yeah, or rephrase. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got three questions that are kind of similar, um, so I'm going to amalgamate them in the interest of time. So the first one is about children's art, um, yes. like Reading Rainbow or Sesame Street, or okay. government money that sends uh, musicians to inner city schools or makes art available to children. And even under the Soviets, this is the second question, classical music was available to everybody at a much more affordable price because all art was sort of the same price. Um, is there a problem with bringing Mozart to the masses. Um, and then the third one uh, is that not all that, so I think that these are um, related and I hope you'll agree. Otherwise, this is gonna be a really complicated question. The third one is that um, a lot of art may be unlikely to pass the market test. Uh, in that case, should the government be providing the most unpopular art? Is that what should be subsidized? So in all three cases, I think we're talking about what about the art that's not necessarily going to make it through to the people that we believe it should make it through to because of restrictions on the market. You know, children can't buy uh, the art that would, well, they can't know what art is going to be valuable as they go forwards. Um, the value of getting something like Mozart to everybody um, and also the unknown value of unpopular or controversial or offensive art. Um, do you think that those are cases in which it makes more sense for the government to be involved? I, you know, I think I think that there's a there are different questions going on here. Some of this is a question about delivery systems, right? Okay. Is it necessary to um, you know do you need to send the Cleveland Symphony into the classroom in order for the kids to hear the Cleveland Symphony? You don't need to do that anymore. And bringing the Cleveland Symphony into the classroom through, why look, here I am in your living rooms, right? Through, uh, through electronic media like this, through CDs, through, um, they don't, it's not even CDs anymore, through, what do you kids call it, the, the iPod, right? Um, and through, through YouTube performances and, and, all, and, and um, Spotify and all of these other ways that you can access music is be becoming increasingly less expensive and increasingly accessible um, right. to everybody. And I think that that's important. Um, but that's a delivery system question, right? I think that, that there are also market responses. Growing up in Cleveland in the 70s, as I did, um, the city was really interested in building their opera program. Um, and so what they did was for the um, matinee performances, they offered if you bought seasons, a pair of adult seasons matinee 
tickets, right, for all of the operas. You got X number of children's tickets for, um, I don't know, $7 a performance, right, each performance of the season. So it let going to the opera become a family thing, right? right? And this was enormously smart because not only did they fill seats during the matinees when it's harder to fill a house, but they grew up an entire generation of people in Cleveland who started going to the opera when they were seven, eight, nine, ten. That's how you grow opera fans, right? So it was a smart market decision and it was a smart investment in the future of music in Cleveland, right? Um, so I think that there are lots of ways to solve these problems that are not that, that don't have to be um, that don't have to be done by by the government. I do right. think art um, art in the schools is very important. Um, I think kids are natural artists and natural creators of art and appreciators of, of all kinds of art. Um, I agree, but yeah. I, I, I question that that art has to be brought in by by the government. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple of other uh, responses from people. I want to very quickly make sure that we touch on one thing before we go back to uh, to questions, because I think I, we, I've got a couple more questions written down, but we've sort of handled one of them. Um, but I want to talk with you, Sarah, about the implications of the government not understanding subjective value, which we can sort of see in the way that it funds art that's extraordinarily popular. Or we could also see, for instance, if, uh, as Sandy suggested, uh, they only supported art that was very unpopular, um, not understanding the way that art really depends on the person who's consuming it and the person who's making it. Um, if we expand that, uh, the way that the government just doesn't understand subjective value more broadly, that it's really an individual, um, an individualistic thing, that you're not going to know ahead of time, well, we're, we're pretty good friends and I don't know I, had, I, I, could, I don't know your favorite color, for instance, and I really don't expect the government to know your favorite color. Um, right. And I don't expect the government to know how much you value something like weekends off, for instance, or a flexible work week, or um, you know, any number of things. Being able to get insurance through your health, uh, through your employer, I should say, or <laughs> how you would like to consume your health care, how you would like to pay for anything, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, subjective value and the knowledge problem are like this. Yeah. Right? And and the, just so everybody knows, because we did handle this in a, in a different event with Steve Horowitz, the, the knowledge problem is kind of the way that we can't know everything that is to be known, because there are just too many brains with too many wonderful preferences and thoughts out there for us, anybody to know all of them. Um, and, so, and even I can't tell you my preference. I mean, I know some of my preferences, right? I happen to know that purple is my favorite color. And I happen I to know that because I work a lot of weekends, I am enorm I place, place enormous value on weekends when I'm not working, right? But you know, I um, I, I bought a vintage dress the other day because I saw it and it was beautiful, and I didn't know that I valued a dress that was older than I am <laughs> that highly, but I did, and now I have it, and it makes me happier. Um, but I couldn't had you asked me three days earlier. You know, how do you value, um, you know, a vintage 1968 Paisley shift dress? I would have said. Yeah. And this doesn't mean, you, this also doesn't mean that you now value all um, vintage dresses either. And right. so even if we were to provide this, uh, this information or the number of people who value vintage dresses to try to aggregate um, the values that are out there, which is the kind of thing the government does that can create problems because the government doesn't individualize its policies. Right. Um, it creates one policy for everybody, which is good. We don't want the government picking and choosing favorites in as much as that's possible because you can hopefully quickly see the problems that will stem from that. Um, but the government makes policies on a lot of things, um, more things than we can probably generalize about. And we talked a little bit about this um, in the case of visas, what visas pay for when you uh, apply for a job. Um, we were talking about musicians, but I, f I think that I found out that can in Canada we don't do this anymore, but in the States they still do. Um, musicians have to pay a fee to come to the country. And the reason that you have to pay the fee is to pay for something that's called a labor market survey, which is somebody from the Bureau of Labor Statistics or 
probably Immigration Canada. I'm, I might be getting that wrong. Um, I got so excited that we don't do it anymore that I didn't look into who <laughs> used to do it. Um, would check and make sure there wasn't another exactly the same person as you who's producing the music that you produce in the way that you produce it, and you're taking that Canadian or that American's job by doing it. And Sarah, you told me there's something similar for um, academics as well. Right. If an American academic wants to come to Canada, you have to prove that that you're you're a unique academic individual, um, <laughs> which of course you are. Which you shouldn't have to prove, right? It's, it's, right. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Both. It's ridiculous on any number of le levels, yeah. right? And, and and problematic. And so and so, I think that what, one message that I really hope that people can take home from our discussion today is. Um, subjective value is important in art and it's important in, in other things, um, but what makes it important is that we're individuals. Um, and we need to really acknowledge more often that we don't know, it, it really does feed into, like you said, the knowledge problem. They're like this. Uh, we can't know how everybody's going to value everything because it's so subjective and to try and make policies based on the idea that we can is at least problematic and we should be darn sure um, that we know what we're doing and that we know that the decisions that we're making are really what everybody would like before uh, foisting them upon people. Right, and I think it's, it's interesting that, that you've sort of taken us into this um, thinking about individuality because one of the, the reasons that I value art as highly as I do, and I this is um, part of the discussion that's um, in the the New Students for Liberty um, and Atlas book on uh, peace, love, and liberty. Um, I, I did an essay for them about um, war poetry, um, and one of the reasons that I value art as highly as I do is because it is one of the best ways that we have of hearing the voices of individuals. Um, it's one of our best ways that we have of, of listening to people who we might not otherwise get to hear. Um, the poet Tom Wayman um, has a poem that's called What Good Poems Are For. I think he's a Canadian, Janet. He might be a Canadian. Uh, but he's got a beautiful poem called What Good Poems Are For. Um, and I'll, I'll send you a link to it after this so you can put it up if you want to. Yeah, I'll share it with everybody. Uh, and it, uh, one of the lines in it is, in a world full of people talking, a person is speaking. Right? And to me, that difference between the cacophonous noise of all of these people talking and then out of that noise comes this one clear voice that we get a chance to really hear and really attend to. Um, that's one of the things that, that for me, um, is one of the reasons that I value art the way that I do. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I got shivers from that line. It's a good line. It's a really <laughs> good, beautiful poem. Um, and let me just, sorry guys, I'm just going to look at the time. Uh, we are very short on time, um, but I'm glad we could talk about that because I want to get your brains working and you can feel free to email uh, me afterwards. But I'm, in the meantime, I'm going to launch our last poll, which is just kind of some fun. Um, uh, and it, it'll give me a chance to read. I have a comment from Peter who I'm, I'm going to out him. It's my dad. Um, and I Hi, think it's dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, I, I've often held these on Mondays, and he works Monday nights, so it's a, he can listen because it's Tuesday. Um, so he says, most art is driven by the artist for a variety of motives or reasons. Politics may just be another motive or reason to create art. The quality of the art that results will relate to the engagement of the artist on the subject. How it is received and how it is valued will likely be a factor of the audience of which it was direct, to which it was directed. Um, an example of a widely used political piece of art, and I would, I'm going to elaborate on uh, what my dad said and say it's, it's actually propaganda, was the iconic World War II recruitment poster, Uncle Sam Wants You. The piece right. is both widely accepted and for that reason would be very valuable if you were given a chance to purchase the original. Um, which I think is true, and I wanted to uh, quickly say that I think that's really true about that piece of art because that's being used. Um, there's oh one of the one of the Charles Koch uh, maybe the Charles Koch no no it's uh, Generation Opportunity has of course used the Uncle Sam um, 
iconic poster to protest the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so it's, it's really interpreted in a wide variety of ways. Uh, to someone who is more supportive of the military, um, it will be seen as patriotic, and as someone who's uh, maybe more opposed to war, it can be seen as something that's maybe a little bit disturbing. Um, right, and a, 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 a parallel example to this, and I'm going to get the number of it wrong, and somebody will probably type in and, and correct me. Um, Shostakovich um, was composing um, under the Soviets, and his either fifth or tenth, I think, um, has this incredibly grand militaristic march in the middle of it. And it made the Soviets really happy, and when you hear it today, it is dripping with irony and dripping with sarcasm and it is so hostile to the very kind of jingoistic, jingoistic nationalistic militarization that the Soviets were pushing that one is astounded that they could not hear it um, yeah. or did not hear it and so yes it's really evolved beyond um, what and and I think um, I think he's right when he says that um, oh I have to share this I'm sorry it's, People are confident that they love their mom. <laughs> As a mom, I have to say, I feel that that, that warms <laughs> my heart. Except for one person who has has been moved by us to be very concerned about the knowledge problem, <laughs> and is not sure how much the Mona Lisa likes their mom. Uh, sorry, guys, I just had to share that. Um, I wanted to say though that uh, so I'm, I'm a pretty anti-war um, person. And yet, given the chance to have that original copy of that poster, I totally still would because it's just such a, uh, there is something that kind of transcends it, right? Like if you don't like the Beatles, but you could get an original cut of the White Album, you would be kind of a dummy to say no, even if you just sold it. But um, anyway, uh, so that's kind of, kind of wrap up our uh, discussion, but I wanted to give Sarah a chance to talk about some of her favorite artists. And you should be, and art, I don't know how to qualify one of them, if they're an artist or if it's art or what it is. Um, so you should hopefully be able to see them on your screen. Um, Sarah, can you see them or is it only for the viewers? Uh, I can see most of them. I see Night Vale and I see Radar versus Wolf. Okay, and so the third one is Lindy Vaughanfjord. Oh, well, Lindy. Course. Right. Um, and these these are not just uh, these are not just favorite producers of art, but these are um, favorite producers of art um, who either art that shares our interest um, in liberty and in in, uh, in criticizing government, and in the case of Welcome to Night Vale, particularly in criticizing uh, government and also crony capitalism. Um, Radar versus Wolf um, is, we like to call them the, the Bleeding Heart Libertarian House Band. Um, they're a band um, that uh, currently, currently doing some, some touring. Their first CD is out. Um, they're a bunch of anarchist uh, libertarians, as you can see from their little bomb, um, and their Bleeding Heart Libertarian yeah. in their their fun guys. logo. There um, and uh, they make great music. They played at the Students for Liberty conference. Um, and Lindy Vaughanfjord is, is of course. The um, a, what twelve foot tall Icelandic <laughs> liberty loving folk singer in Canada, yes, um, who's who's all over the the uh, the internet. And what I like about um, what I like about their the the works of art um, produced by by all three of uh, these sets of folks is um, that it's not. Didactic. I mean, and I, you know, I enjoy didactic art. John John Popola's um, raps on the Hayek Keynes debate are brilliant, right? But they're they're teaching tools. Um, yeah. You can also Rather enjoy them. You can enjoy art. them as art, but they're teaching tools, yeah. right? And and this is this is pure aesthetic delight. Um, the stuff that these folks are are producing. So you might uh, consider having a listen. Um, check out uh, the touring. All actually, all three of these. Um, Groups are on tour. Welcome yes. to Night Vale does live shows. Radar versus Wolf is touring, and I know Lindy tours a lot. So check out their web pages and find he's, out where they're going to be. He's currently in Atlantic Canada. So if there are any Atlantic Canadians, and I think, oh rats, I can't remember which state Radar versus Wolf are in tonight. I but feel they're, like they're they might be in Florida right now, but I'm yeah, not they're sure. touring the southeast right now. So I will send links to everybody um, so that you can check out whether these guys will be coming close to you, and if not, fear not, dear listeners, because. 
they're all available uh, to consume as uh, online art. Um, so thank you so much, Sarah, for well, being thank on you tonight. For having me. This was so much fun. Um, Sarah has a column which she mentioned with the Freeman. Uh, I will be sharing that as well because they are just some really interesting book reviews. Uh, it's unlikely that you will read another book review column that will make you think as hard and as, in as unexpected ways as Sarah's does. Uh, Thank so I'm you excited very much. to share it with everybody. And um, Why Liberty is already out. You can find it through Students for Liberty. Um, and Peace, Love, Liberty is forthcoming. Both uh, are available, I believe. Why Liberty, I believe, is available online as a PDF. Yes. Um, and Peace, Love, Liberty should be as well. But you can also request copies. Um, they are to be made available to spread the wonderful uh, writing and ideas that are in them. Um, yes, and just for zero to, dollars. So yeah, for, for at zero monetary cost to you, uh, you can have a copy of these lovely books. Um, and I just wanted to give everybody a heads up about my next event, which is with Sloan Frost, who is the uh, oh, she's got a cute name for Students for Liberty that I love. Uh, she's like the mom of Students she's for Liberty. The Liberty Mama. Yeah. The Liberty Mom. That's yeah, that's what it is. Uh, it, it's great, and she's wonderful. And we're going to be talking about healthcare and why the system is such a mess. Um, so I really hope that everybody will be available to tune in for that. Uh, you should be able to see on your screen that it's at August 12th at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern because Sloan is in the central time zone, and I don't want to uh, totally mess with everybody's dinner time. So hopefully we have everybody uh, available to come and join us. And that's all for tonight. Thank you again, Sarah, and thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for having me, Janet.